The Gale of the Red Mist is a dangerous place, and weapons are key to an anime vampire's survival, as the old saying goes. Welcome to a comprehensive weapon guide for Code Vein. I'll be splitting this up into multiple parts based on weapon class. It will include where to find these weapons, my opinions on their general usefulness, and the damage they deal for a character at level 1, level 50, level 100, level 200, and the max level of 300. In this video, we will cover great swords. For the sake of accurate comparison, I'll be using the Queen Slayer Blood Code with the Willpower Up, Strength Plus Willpower Up, Mind Plus Willpower Up, and the Mind Up Passives. This will give us an A rating in every stat that is relevant to weapons, and thus allow us to wield every single weapon in the game with the same build. I would not recommend using this build for exploring, since you can only equip two weapons at a time, and it misses out on a few really useful passives and active buffs. It's better to have a setup that leans into your chosen weapon's strengths and your own personal playstyle. I'll be throwing around some terms as I describe the weapons and their moves, so let's make sure there isn't any confusion. The weak attack is just that, a quicker, low damage, low stamina cost attack. The weak attack chain is simply the series of attacks that happen when you repeatedly press the weak attack button. Sometimes it's just two swings, sometimes it's three swings, and sometimes it's four swings. Then the animations loop around back to the first swing. The sprinting attack is a weak attack you use while sprinting. Shocking, I know. I usually won't go out of my way to say anything about the sprinting attacks unless it's something special. Same for the rolling attacks. The animation changes depending on whether you dodge forwards, backwards, or to the sides, but they don't really fit into the weak attack chain, or they just act as a substitute for the first swing. A combo weak attack is a unique move each weapon has that you can do by holding the dash button and pressing weak attack while not moving your character. It's usually a lunging attack that covers a lot of ground, an attack that knocks enemies down, a wide sweeping attack, or a combination of these. The uncharged heavy attack is what you get when you tap the heavy attack button. The fully charged heavy is when you hold the heavy attack button for a few seconds. There is no partial charge mechanic in code vein. If you let go of the heavy attack button too soon, you will just perform an uncharged heavy attack. Feel free to practice the different moves to your heart's content on the training dummy back at home base. Speaking of the training dummy at home base, I'll be performing all of the damage tests on it. This is worth mentioning because the dummy has neither any elemental resistances nor elemental weaknesses. Some weapons have innate elemental damage and will be more effective against some enemies and weaker against others. I'll mention this again when we get to the individual weapons with built-in elemental damage. Lastly, all of the weapons were tested without any transformations since this can change the damage dramatically based on your level, what passives you have equipped, and what you're fighting. You can think of the damage numbers I provide as a rough estimate for a generic character rather than the highest possible damage you can achieve with the right preparations. Okay, now that the preliminary stuff has been cleared up, let's jump right in! The powerhouse weapons of Code Vein, two-handed swords or great swords, combine the highest raw damage available with excellent blocking and heavy amounts of stagger. They are also superb at knocking enemies down or sending them sprawling. It's actually quite rare to find a great sword that can't easily hit an enemy so hard they have to change postal codes. These are far and away the most beginner-friendly class of weapons. You honestly have the greatest likelihood of success with one of these beasts in your hands. However, all this power comes at a cost. Great swords are quite hefty, so you will most likely struggle with mobility if you equip one. This isn't necessarily a deal-breaker with gifts like Shifting Hollow or Revenant's Ambition, but consider yourself warned all the same. The stamina cost and slow swing speed of your attacks are a different story, though. Where the one-handed swords could squeeze in two or three attacks with each opening, great swords can only manage a single attack safely. While it's true that the more you level up, the more stamina you'll have, nothing will increase the attack speed. It is absolutely necessary that you don't get greedy when using a great sword. Otherwise, you'll be transported to the pain dimension. One last thing, I had some trouble getting accurate damage numbers for some of the great swords with projectile attacks. This is because the great swords have good drain ratings and would often fire off the projectile if the initial slash hit. That's great for you, since running out of i due to purely melee is almost impossible, but it sucked for me while making this guide. The important notes are included on the spreadsheet, linked in the description. Now, let's take a closer look at the individual greatswords, shall we? The Queenslayer Greatsword The very first greatsword you can get your hands on is the curved Queenslayer Greatsword. It is located nearby where Oliver gets smacked and sits crying. It's pretty easy to overlook if you're in a hurry. Then again, skipping this weapon isn't a big deal, because you can get a much better one in the ruined city center, the very next area after the tutorial boss. The weak attack chain is a diagonal slash followed by a horizontal one going from right to left, and a final horizontal chop going the other direction. 
The combo weak attack is a backstep and slash, which is good for evading incoming attacks from multiple enemies. The uncharged heavy is a slow vertical slam with a big windup. The fully charged heavy is a brutal double slash, where the second hit will knock enemies down. All in all, this great sword is pretty unremarkable. It looks cool with a concave curve and serrated edge, so at least it has that going for it. However, it's difficult to knock enemies down if you aren't counting how many swings it takes to stagger them. It's perfectly serviceable, but there are better great swords out there. The Zweihander. The king of great swords for a first playthrough, the Zweihander is top of the pile in many aspects. You can find it in a chest hidden by debris after you exit the parking garage through the shortcut as shown by this route. There is another Zwei already transformed to intensification available from a chest in the Cliffs of Rust Depths, but you can actually get the one in the story much faster. As soon as you're able, you should gather enough valuables to trade with Yakimo for an Atlas Chrome, and then scrounge up 10,000 Haze so you can transform it to fortification at Rin's shop. This gives you a full 100% block against any attack that can be blocked, and your trusty Zwei receives a boost in damage too. The weak attack chain is a vertical chop followed by a horizontal one. The combo weak attack is a thrust that knocks enemies down. The uncharged heavy is a slow horizontal chop, while the fully charged heavy is a slow vertical slam. Because of the absurd size of this weapon, you can cover a lot of ground with all of its attacks and deal tons of damage. The biggest drawback is certainly the weight. Even before transforming it to fortification, it is one of the heaviest weapons. Fortunately, Revenant's Ambition, Hasten, Shifting Hollow, and Mobility Enhancer items will offset the only weakness this weapon has, making you unstoppable. The Nagi Makuro Not to be confused with its pint-sized cousin, the Hani Makuro, this great sword is a 55-gallon drum of hurt. It has a quicker swing speed than does Y, but the trade-off is less damage per swing. It's also the second lightest greatsword, meaning you should have no trouble getting normal mobility. With a dedicated scout build, you can even get quick mobility, though you will have to sacrifice more damage. You can find the Nagi Makuro in the second half of the Cathedral of Sacred Blood, almost directly above the Cathedral Perimeter Checkpoint. Just climb a couple of ladders and defeat an uncoordinated Big Mama to claim your prize. The weak attack chain is an upward diagonal slash, followed by a mostly horizontal one. The combo weak attack is a good old enemy toppling thrust. The uncharged heavy is a short lunging horizontal slash that covers a lot of ground, while the fully charged heavy is a slower lunging horizontal chop that goes even further than the uncharged heavy. All things considered, this isn't a bad weapon. The moveset is pretty good, but I just wish it dealt a little more damage. Then again, the same could be said of all the odd weapons I like. The Oni Bane. As Yakumo's personalized Nagi Makuro, it shares a lot of the same strengths of its less special brother, but it is heavier and deals more damage. The Oni Bane also has different heavy attacks and combo weak attacks compared to the standard Nagi Makuro. You can acquire this weapon by trading valuables with Yakumo until you have 50 friendship points. The weak attack chain is a diagonal swing followed by a horizontal one. The combo weak attack is a diving slash that can knock enemies down while also moving you out of harm's way. It doesn't actually have any iframes, but it's good at repositioning yourself. Be careful while using this move though, since there's a dead zone right in front of you. Basically, just take a couple of steps back before using this move. The uncharged heavy attack is an overhead chop with a hefty windup. This may appear not so great at first look, but when the sword is vertically covering your body, it actually has blocking frames. And I mean frames. The blocking window is a very narrow. Finally, the fully charged heavy is a hardy horizontal slash with relatively short range compared to the standard Naki Makuro. This is a pretty fun to use greatsword. It won't be setting any high damage records, but the moveset is quite interesting. Plus, you can get a quick dodge with a scout high mobility build, so long as you don't care about sacrificing some damage. If you want to undergo the farming to acquire this thing, I feel you won't be disappointed. And considering how many trading valuables you can get in a single playthrough that are worth 5 friendship points with Yakumo, you don't really have to do much farming. 8 out of 10 would recommend to friends and family. The Warped Blade A jawbone ripped out of the face of a very large lost specimen, the Warped Blade is a cruel looking weapon. It does have a few glaring flaws that no amount of good looks can fix though. It has split physical and elemental damage for one. Split damage is inconvenient because your weapon's damage has to cut through an enemy's physical defense and elemental defense. Worse still, the element is blood, meaning almost all the big scary things resist it. There is a plus six version found in a chest near the third checkpoint of Ashen Cavern. Be warned, however, because going for the chest spawns multiple waves of enemies, also known as a blood trial. 
There's also a plus zero inhibit transformed warped blade in the arachnid grotto depths, but considering how you would need to reverse the transformation and then upgrade it, plus the fact you can't reach arachnid grotto until after you clear Ashen Cavern, I recommend you just grab the one with the blood trial. The weak attack chain is a diagonal slash followed by two alternating horizontal chops. The combo weak attack is the familiar old powerful thrust. The uncharged heavy is an upward slash that kicks up a single blood geyser, while the fully charged heavy is an upward slash that kicks up three delayed blood geysers directly in front of you. These two heavy attacks drove me insane while recording the damage numbers. It's quite common for the blood geysers to hit twice or three times. Again, great for you, but bad for me. I've jotted down the most accurate numbers I could, but again, check the spreadsheet for details. The Warped Blade had the potential to be a really good and interesting weapon, but the built-in blood damage is really holding it back. It's still interesting, but a tad weak in terms of practicality. The Black Greatsword What happens when you cross a Queenslayer Greatsword with the Oni Bane and add some fancy heavy attacks thrown in for good measure? You get the Black Greatsword, of course! It also boasts good defense, giving you 100% block on everything but pierce damage once fortified. You can get it as early as Ashen Cavern. Just repeatedly kill the Hunter in Black near the locked door leading to the City of Falling Flame until he drops it. There's also a Gifts Transformed Black Greatsword from a chest in Misty Ruins, but the same advice from the other Greatswords applies here. You'll have to spend Haze to convert it back to normal, and you can get the one from the story much faster. The Weak Attack Chain is a diagonal chop followed by two alternating horizontal sweeps. The combo weak attack is the same diving slash with a dead zone from the Oni Bane, capable of knocking enemies down and repositioning yourself. The uncharged heavy is the delayed vertical slash with blocking frames, while the fully charged heavy is a slow horizontal chop that kicks up three blood geysers along the swing arc. This was another one of the great swords that was difficult for me to record accurate numbers. I'm just going to give you the most common damage if you hit with the majority of the geysers. For those who guessed that I enjoy using this weapon, pat yourself on the back for guessing correctly. It's somewhat easy to acquire, has reasonable enough weight, and a fun moveset. Give this thing a shot if you don't have the strength for the Oni Bane. The damage is quite low, so in the majority of situations, it's better just to do whatever is necessary to wield the Oni Bane. The Argent Wolf King's Blade The actual king of the two-handed sword meta, the Argent Wolf King's Blade is the last boss weapon you will get, and one of the most powerful. The real strength of this weapon isn't the damage numbers, although they are quite high. No, the real strength comes with its swing speed. Spamming uncharged heavy attacks is faster than any other greatsword swing in the whole game. Besides that, it behaves like a standard Y without the insane weight and insane blocking capabilities. You get this weapon upon defeating Skull King, so it's guaranteed no matter which ending you get. The weak attack chain is somewhat similar to this Y-hander, a downward vertical chop followed by a unique horizontal attack that is quicker than usual. The combo weak attack is the old trusty thrusty attack that sends foes flying. The uncharged heavy is a quick horizontal slash that emits a projectile. Yes, this attack gets even better! While the fully charged heavy is a chunky overhead slam that shoots out a projectile that has a small AoE effect when it makes contact with anything. This beefed up projectile attack actually uses three I-Cores, so be warned. It's no wonder why you see this weapon all the time in multiplayer. It's both strong and quick, making it truly worthy of the name King's Blade. Judgment Edge what better way to stick it to Juzo Mito than unraveling his plans with his own sword? To get this greatsword, you just need to defeat Juzo Mito. This weapon functions as a strength-focused and beefier version of the Nagi Makuro, both in terms of damage and weight. The heavy attacks are actually pretty flashy, since both of the uncharged and fully charged heavy attacks extend the glowing red, um, extension. Fortunately for the player, it's all physical damage instead of a split of physical and a ton of blood damage like during Mito's boss fight. Better still is that the flashy heavy attacks don't cost any i to use. The weak attack chain is upwards vertical slash followed by a horizontal one. The combo weak attack is a thrust that knocks enemies down. The uncharged heavy is a horizontal double slash with a lengthy wind-up since the sword has to extend before firing off. The fully charged heavy is a powerful overhead slam that also has a slow wind-up for very much the same reason. Truthfully, I haven't used this sword very much. I've always preferred the Zwei-Hander over the Nagi Makuro. At least the Nagi Makuro is light enough to allow for a natural quick dodge with the right setup. The same cannot be said of Judgment's Edge. Besides ranking very high in style, Judgment's Edge is pretty basic. The Sunset Greatsword What an odd weapon. 
The Sunset Greatsword is pretty much a Queenslayer Greatsword that's been corrupted by the Queen's Miasma. It's slightly rarer than the other Sunset Weapons, since you don't encounter the enemies that wield it until later. However, just like the other Sunset Weapons, it has a decent enough drop rate. The main strength of this weapon is its weight, or lack thereof. The Sunset Greatsword is the lightest greatsword in the game, and as a result, you can achieve natural quick mobility with a multitude of blood codes, especially if you slap on Revenant's Ambition, then alleviate both an Ivory Grace Veil and the Sunset Greatsword itself. On a dedicated Scout Mobility build, you can even skip alleviating the Sunset Greatsword, it's that lightweight. The weak attack chain is identical to the Queenslayer Greatsword, a diagonal chop followed by alternating horizontal sweeps. The combo weak attack is a diving slash that can't knock enemies down, but still whiffs if you're too close. The uncharged heavy is a slow overhead slice, while the fully charged heavy is a double slash that can knock enemies down on the second slash. I feel this greatsword is criminally underrated, especially since weight is such a huge issue with them as a class of weapon. If you're having trouble getting the DLC greatswords, try running a quick dodge sunset greatsword caster setup. It is by no means meta, but teleport dashing around with a heavy weapon has a unique charm. While it struggles to knock enemies down, the Sunset Greatsword is a perfectly acceptable weapon. Unfortunately, it's not particularly outstanding in any aspect besides its weight. The Lost Zweihander Hands down, one of the rarest greatswords, and my absolute favorite, the Lost Zwei trades in some blocking capabilities and damage for an incredible moveset. As it is a standard Zweihander that's been corrupted by Miasma, it shares many of the same swings with the exception of the combo weak attack, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I've only been able to get the Lost Zwei to drop from the final tiny lost enemy of the Crypt Spire and from the same type of enemy in the Lord of Thunder DLC. Let's focus on how to get it from the story since that's the soonest way to get one. Starting from the last checkpoint of Crypt Spire, head down the elevator, send it back up as you walk out, kill the Lost holding his Y, and warp back using the missile route you picked up earlier on in the area. Repeat this until you claim your prize. The weak attack chain is a vertical chop followed by a horizontal one. The combo weak attack is arguably the best in the entire game. It's a sweep like the Queenslayer Greatsword, but it can knock enemies down. This is huge. There is no better weapon for crowd control. The uncharged heavy is a slow horizontal slash, while the fully charged heavy is a slow overhead slam. This weapon is frequently overshadowed by its non-lost cousin, but perhaps that's a good thing. This weapon is very dangerous in the hands of someone who knows the ins and outs of combat. You can just barely get a quick dodge with a dedicated scout build, which is just bonkers to me. It's a shame this excellent weapon is so rare. The Argent Wolf Brand. Ah, the Box Cutter Sword! This one is also quite rare, since it only drops from great sword wielding Cerberus Knights, the earliest of which can be found in the Hellfire Knight DLC, just outside of the morphing lightning bug miniboss. If you want to keep things vanilla, head to the last checkpoint of the government outskirts and ambush the knight overlooking the previous area, and run back to the missile to reset it. Rinse and repeat until you get the sword. Besides good looks, this sword has pretty decent blocking capabilities once fortified. Just like the Black Greatsword, you can block everything but pierce damage. The weak attack chain is a vertical strike followed by a horizontal one. The combo weak attack is that familiar old thrust. The uncharged heavy is a lunging horizontal slash, while the fully charged heavy is another lunging horizontal slash, but it covers a lot more ground. I honestly really like this sword's style. At its core, it really is just a weaker's Y that's only slightly less hefty. If style points are the most important aspect of your weapon choice, or if you're making a hybrid melee caster build and don't mind normal mobility, then I recommend the Box Cutter Sword. The Wrathful Balmung. Our first DLC greatsword, and a quite disappointing one at that. The Wrathful Balmung is basically a sunset greatsword, but heavier and with a fire buff. To get this great sword, you need to defeat Hellfire Knight with a great sword while dying no more than three times in a single attempt. Since his HP pool is so large, I recommend using a Sunset Great Sword on a quick dodge build and casting him to death. The Wrathful Balmung has a very greedy dexterity requirement, but kind of makes up for it with increased damage when compared to the Sunset Great Sword. This is a slightly flawed perspective, however, since the true strength of the Sunset Great Sword is how light it is, not how much damage it deals. The weak attack chain is a diagonal slash followed by two alternating horizontal ones. The combo weak attack is a diving slash with the same weird hitbox that also can't knock enemies down. 
The uncharged heavy attack is a delayed vertical chop, while the fully charged heavy is a double slash that sets your blade alight. The buff remains if you switch weapons, and stacks with other buffs and items. The Wrathful Baobong is the only pure dexterity greatsword, but it is far too heavy to consider using over the Executioner one-handed sword, or any of the Katana-style one-handed swords. The absolute worst part about this sword is its inability to knock enemies down. All you can do is stagger them. One of the most useful properties of greatswords is their ability to yeet opponents off cliffs or score some free hits while your foes struggle to get upright again. It's a real shame that this greatsword doesn't really have a niche it can fill well. The Azure Greatsword In a nutshell, the good DLC greatsword. It's basically a box cutter sword that's been dipped in liquid nitrogen. You earn it by defeating the Frozen Empress with three revives or fewer while wielding any greatsword. She's quite weak to fire, so a quick dodge casting setup with the Sunset Greatsword is my recommendation yet again. Just like the standards Y-Hander, you can achieve 100% block in all categories, once fortified. The moveset is identical to the standard box cutter sword, except the fully charged heavy will freeze the blade, giving you an ice buff that sticks around if you change weapons. The buff isn't built in ice damage, so it is still mostly effective against enemies that resist ice, and the extra little oomph is good for those enemies that are weak to ice damage. Unfortunately, the damage scaling is quite weak, so pick the standard box cutter sword if you've leveled up at all, or if you're going against enemies weak to ice. Since I usually play at level 1, this is another one of my favorite weapons. The Blanched Greatsword. How about we finish off our list with a forgettable greatsword whose only saving grace is a gimmicky supercharged attack? Well, it is also the heaviest greatsword, but that's not something to be proud of. The Blanched Greatsword is part of the God Eater collaboration set, meaning you have to pay real money to add this to your game. After installing the DLC, go talk to Ren to pick up the sword for super cheap. The moveset is almost perfectly identical to the Queenslayer Greatsword, except for the heavy attacks. The weak attack chain is a diagonal slash, followed by two alternating horizontal chops. The combo weak attack is a backstep slash that can't knock enemies down. The uncharged heavy is a slow, horizontal attack, while the fully charged heavy is a vertical slam, but imbued with the power of the Aragami. This fully charged heavy doesn't cost any Icor, which is why I call it a gimmick. However, while it looks impressive, it doesn't actually reach any further than usual. Out of the three God Eater weapons, this is the worst. It has high base damage, which makes it good at low levels, but you can't get it before reaching home base for the first time, and you quickly pick up the upgraded Y-Hander soon after leaving base for that very same first time. This sword is immediately overshadowed by that one simple fact. Worse still, it has no way to knock enemies down. Sure, you can stagger them, but that's not enough if you're getting chased down by an aggressive foe. The damage is unremarkable at higher levels, and it's too heavy to justify using this instead of this Y or the Argent Wolf King's Blade. Pass this sword up unless you really, really like slow, flashy attacks. And there we go! All the two-handed great swords in Code Vein. Thank you for watching this all the way through. I hope this guide was helpful. See you next time!